Okay, I promised everybody a special and interesting topic this time, and we shall have it. We are going to look at evanescent waves. Last time, we took a look at what happens if you have a plane wave coming in and striking an interface at some angle. You can sit down and you can write the fields associated with that incident wave, the reflected wave, and the transmitted wave, and derive all sorts of interesting constraints on them. One of the constraints we derived was Schnell's law. n1 sine theta equals n2 sine theta prime, where n1 and n2 are the indices of refraction on the left and right respectively, with the wave traveling from left to right. Now, the funny thing about this equation is it doesn't actually have solutions for every possible combination of n1, n2, theta, and theta prime. In fact, if you solve for theta prime, you get the following. And so if n1 over n2 sine theta is greater than 1, we have a problem. We can't actually get a real solution for theta prime. And we can flip that around to a condition on theta. Now, note that it's only possible for n1 over n2 sine theta to be greater than 1 if n1 is greater than n2. So you have to be going from some material of greater index to some material of lesser index. So, for example, from glass to air. If you're in air traveling to glass, this can't happen. You always get a solution. Everything's great. But if n1 is greater than n2, you can actually find this angle here which I'm going to make theta sub c and call it the critical angle. The input angle is greater than that critical angle. You don't get a solution for the transmitted angle. What we did in Phys 2 was we simply said, oh, well, that just means there's no transmitted wave. You get 100% reflection, and we'll call that total internal reflection. But that's not the whole story. Why don't we just sort of blindly plunge forward with the more mature math that we developed last time and see what happens. This is how we wrote the field in the transmitted region. Why don't we go ahead and blow that out into all its little details. As before, I'm going to suppress Z. We'll just look at X and Y and that'll contain all the pertinent information. As you may recall, the K vector for the transmitted region is of magnitude n2 omega over c, which lets us write the i-hat and j-hat components of the k-vector as such. And so we can continue to manipulate our expression for the field in the transmitted region and get... All right, so there it is in all its glorious detail. Now let's see, what in here is going to break if our input angle is above that critical angle? Looking at it piece by piece, there's really nothing that can go wrong with the amplitude vector. Oh, e to the minus i omega t, there's really nothing there that could do anything too screwy. What about this thing with that sine theta? We've had issues with sine theta when we've looked at this before. Hmm, sine theta prime... Well, no, that's always going to have a real solution for sine theta prime. Sine theta prime is always going to be a real number. It may be a real number greater than 1, but it's always a real number. So there's really nothing in that term that can break. So what about in that little bugger right there? What might go wrong? Hmm. We don't have an expression for cos theta prime yet. But we know cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1, so we can say that. Okay, so here's where something can get weird. If sine of theta prime is greater than 1, then that cos theta prime term is going to be something imaginary. Maybe we don't know exactly what, but it's some kind of imaginary quantity, so I'm going to just sort of abstract it out and define it to be i times big squiggle. So what happens if you take a look at the field in the transmitted region when the input angle is greater than that critical angle, the amplitude stays the same, e to the minus i omega t stays the same, you get this propagating term that has a y in it, and you get this funny e to the minus n2 omega over c big squiggle x. That comes from taking the thing that was of the form e to the i cos theta prime and subbing in i squiggle into that. So the i's combine and give you the minus, 
and everything's great. Hmm, okay. Let's get a little insight. Why don't we take the real part of this and see what the field would actually look like? Now, there's nothing physically preventing something like this from existing. This is a perfectly legitimate electric field. It's a plane wave in the y direction, modulated by some sort of sharp exponential decay. So what we have is we have a wave in the transmitted region that's oriented along the boundary and gets rapidly weaker as you get farther and farther from the boundary. And we call this an evanescent wave. And this is a real thing that actually exists. It's tricky to detect because it usually falls off over just a few wavelengths, but it's perfectly accessible to experiment and is even used in a variety of technologies, some of which we'll discuss in class. Perhaps the easiest way to detect it is indirectly. Suppose you actually have three regions. You have a slab of index N2 with N1 on either side of it, and you shoot a plane wave in from the left. I'm going to draw it as normal incidence just for clarity, but you know, let's pretend all the angles work out and all that. Then what we're going to have is we're going to have most of the wave reflect back. In that N2 region, in that transmitted region, where according to our Phys 2 understanding, things are forbidden, we're going to have this evanescent wave that decays exponentially. And if there's another boundary between N2 and N1 on the other side, and it's close enough that that evanescent wave hasn't gone to zero yet, a real wave will actually pop out the other side. We call this phenomenon frustrated total internal reflection. A wave comes in from the left, mostly reflects off. There's an exponential decay in this N2 region. And if the gap is small enough before you get back to N1, that field can get coupled off into that third region and continue on its merry way. Does this look familiar? Does this maybe look a little bit like quantum mechanical tunneling? In tunneling, you have a free particle wave function coming in from the left. There's a barrier whose energy is such that you can't have a particle observed in the barrier, but you do have a wave function there that has sort of an exponential decay. And if the barrier is thin enough, that particle couples over into the region on the other side of it, and in a sense sort of just squirts through that barrier. The mathematics of that really is just the same as the mathematics behind an evanescent wave. Same tools, different context, very cool physics in either case.